Learning about security doesn't need to be scary. If you want to ship code securely with confidence, check out the URL below and challenge yourself with thousands of challenges in 29 coding frameworks. Let the games begin. Now, I'd love to introduce a really good friend of mine who comes all the way from Melbourne via San Francisco. So, <laughs> so Frenchie, would you like to come up on stage, mate? And he's going to be talking about Kubernetes, specifically around K-Rail. It's going to be awesome too. He's going to be releasing. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Cool. Um, before I kick off, I would like to say thanks to mum and dad for coming. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, welcome Kubernauts. Um, thank you so much for coming along after lunch. Uh, you have willingly subjected yourself to my beard after I've just finished eating. Um, that is an experience that no human should uh, ever experience. Uh, Dustin, my colleague, uh, we were originally going to dual present this. Uh, he's one of the main authors of, of K-Rail. Uh, unfortunately, he had to head back to San Francisco, um, so you just get more of my terrible jokes. I'm sorry. Um, wonderful. What we're going to talk to you about today, uh, so here we've got uh, a general introduction. Um, so we're going to be talking about Kubernetes today. Um, uh, I will get a rough feel of the audience in a little bit, um, but uh, TLDR is Kubernetes can be very trivially insecure. Um, there's a lot of good tooling around there to support uh, attacking clusters as well. Uh, and then we'll talk about a solution that we were kind of hoping existed, and then when we noticed that that didn't exist out in the world, we went and built something called K-Rail. Uh, it was open sourced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we'll demonstrate it today, uh, demonstrate it today for you, and uh, hopefully you enjoy it, and we'd love the contributions. Before we jump in, the, uh, the typical you know, dollar sign who am I slide, slide is a little bit dated, uh, so that should return pretty much the same results, uh, users on a system. Um, I am Sam Stewart, uh, confusingly also called Frenchie as well. Um, Dustin, my, my co-presenter, had to head back. Uh, we work for a company called Cruise Automation. Uh, they make self-driving cars over in San Francisco. Um, I'll get the evil corporate shilling out of the way early. We're hiring. Um, if you're interested in also making self-driving cars, come say hi. So let me, let me get a read of the audience. Who here uh, has never heard of Kubernetes before? Give me a big pirate yar on the count of three. One, two, three. OK, a couple of people. All right. Uh, who here has maybe used it once or twice, is not super confident, knows a little bit about it? Yar? OK, cool. That's a bit better. Who here is very confident, has used it a lot, knows it very well? And who here is just here to troll me? OK, that's most of the audience, right? Wonderful. Um, I know the audience. Uh, cool. So what is, what is a Kubernetes? Um, so often people will see a description something like this. It's an open source container orchestration system for automating application deployment, scaling, and management with a diagram that looks something like that that really leaves you scratching your head. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it doesn't really help. It's one of those things you need to know what it does before you can understand what it does kind of things. So let me take it back to very first principles and hopefully bring those who are unfamiliar up to speed and give you the minimum knowledge uh, to come along for the ride. So first principles. Here we have a nerd. This nerd would like to deploy something. So they make a deployment. Uh, this deployment is typically a YAML file with some uh, extra metadata around the thing that they want to deploy, the particular container image, uh, how many of them they want, how they want it to be configured, et cetera. They pass that along to the API server, and then the API server goes and makes things happen for them. That's typically the stopping point for most developers. This is the interaction point they have. They just send it to the API server, make stuff happen. Uh, they don't really care about the internals. I'll go a little bit deeper, but most developers who are using this on a regular basis have this level of understanding. Um, and I'll pause here for a second to talk about the threat model a little bit. Uh, in this case, we're not talking about malicious administrators. Uh, they already have you know, admin level, root level on the cluster. They, they can do whatever they want. We're also not talking about you know, hackers off in the ether who are unauthenticated. The sorts of people in our threat model here are people who have the ability to deploy. So you know, pen testers who've stolen credentials, uh, people who've found a bug with the ability to then trigger deployments, systems that can deploy, or most commonly, uh, developers who deploy something but then accidentally misconfigure it. Uh, that is, is the most common case that we see on a regular basis, and that's the threat that we're trying to prevent. Uh, so how does it work in a little bit more detail? We mentioned the API server. So the API server talks to some things called nodes. Uh, and nodes, in this case, are the servers that you're talking about. So EC2, GCE, on-premise, pretty much any compute that you want to be talking to. How does the node know about the API server? Well, there's a little thingy called a kubelet. And the kubelet talks back to the API server and says, hey, have you got things for me to do? Can I affect change on this? 
And then based off that, it'll deploy some things called pods. Uh, and those pods are the containers, and how we mentioned before, how many of them replica sets. Um, it gets a little bit more complex than that, but don't necessarily need to know it at this level. And then the power of, of Kubernetes really comes from the fact that you can have many, many, many nodes with complex configurations across, you know, tens or, or yeah, uh, and tens of thousands is definitely at the upper limit, but yeah, hundreds and thousands of servers certainly with, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pods. Um, so. The other big thing to remember is that uh, Kubernetes is effectively a state machine. So it will take in that deployment, and then based off that, it will make change in the system. So in this case, we're talking about deployments. That will hand it to a deployment controller. That deployment controller will affect change in the system. If a server dies, the uh, API server will bring it back up and go, OK, cool. Hey, we want the, the master will bring it back up and say, yeah, we want 10 of these to exist at all times. Um, that's, that's about as much as you need to know. While, while, while it happens, there's a slight extra thing called a validating webhook, which is how KRail works, um, that validates certain configurations. Um, so we've kind of described this, uh, this system that has planetary scale capabilities, uh, but unfortunately it can be very easily misconfigured uh, with one tiny little hole that then leads to a critical misconfiguration. So really, you can think of Kubernetes as the Death Star. Uh, so in this talk, we will hopefully present to you how a talented pilot can fire proton torpedoes down at exhaust port, causing critical issues. We'll also release a tool, uh, we have released a tool rather, uh, about a, some ways that you can present this, uh, prevent this. Cool, so let's switch over into attack mode a little bit. Um, so we mentioned that compromising vanilla Kubernetes is, is easy. Um, let's, let's go into that a little bit. Part of it comes from the complexity, uh, part of it comes from the fact that developers themselves don't really know that much about how it works and they don't often care, uh, they don't need to know it. Um, and even if you follow best practices such as role-based access control, MTLS, uh, and other things that we've, we've talked about on our blog before, uh, there's still some, some trivial privilege escalation routes that are commonly, uh, commonly found in clusters. Um, the, the blog post there, if you go medium cruise, uh, we, we talk about similar content in more detail. Um, and if you have a container that looks something like this, uh, which is an amazing photo, uh, unfortunately, the, the crap that you've deployed in the container affects the, the container itself. Uh, when we talk about crap, we're talking about bind mounts, so binding to the host file system or to the Docker socket, host networking, uh, running of privileged containers or containers that have the, capa uh, the ability to set capabilities. Um, and that's not even talking about um, you know, kernel vulnerabilities or ODAs. Those are configurable features by design in, in containers. Uh, so the impact of that is if you do misconfigure those uh, ones that I just listed there, it can lead to compromise of the host, compromise of the cluster, and then pivoting throughout the infrastructure from there. We'll go into a little bit more detail with that, but I'll just give one quick example of a demo, and I think I need to press play to get this to start. Uh, so in this case here, the important line is down the bottom, host path, pass slash. Uh, this is deploying a container that is mounting the entire host file system. In Linux, everything is a file, so then you know, uh, host, proc, et cetera, you're now seeing environment variables in the namespace of a different container. The astute observers in the audience will notice there's a private key in there. That is not a private key that your container should, in theory, be able to access, but you can because you can access the file system. Um, so that's one common misconfiguration. Uh, and then we'll talk about another one here. Uh, yep. Uh, where we're uh, mounting the Docker socket. Um, and then in this case, Docker PS from within a container is now giving information about all the other containers running on the system itself. Uh, so that in itself, Docker PS is, is relatively innocuous. Uh, inno Inoculous? That's not a word. Um, relatively innocent. Um, and it's, uh, uh, the, the issue here, however, is that you could easily just, you know, Docker run a privileged container with that same uh, bind mount of the host file system we mentioned in the first place um, and, and cause chaos from there. Um, a little bit more background information, particularly around GCP. Um, uh, cl different cloud providers all have something uh, similar of their, their own sorts, but they, they introduce some extra attack service. Uh, in this case, the, the metadata API. Um, uh, GCP, while they do have a recent feature called metadata concealment, not a lot of people turn it on. Uh, and so if you can then get a container that accesses host networking, you can then get attributes of the underlying node from within the container. So the privilege escalation pathway in this case is from a container, if networking is enabled, talk to the metadata API, 
get the ability to say, yes, I am the node, then either talk to GCP directly or also the Kube API server and say, hey, I'm the host, give me the ability to do host things, please. Uh, and then from there, you can possibly extract secrets from other, other um, nodes, uh, other uh, containers running on that same node. Um, in fact, there's great tooling around this. Um, so greets to a guy called Brad Gieserman. Um, and so I will actually switch over to a demo now and praise to the demo gods, see how this goes. Um, so uh, over on the screen here, and I'll kick it off and then describe what it's doing as I'm talking. Uh, so, uh, let's, so this is that repo here. So uh, uh, you can see, yeah, the, just the one I mentioned, Big Geeseman Kube Stealer. Um, and then I'll kick off this auto exploit and then talk it through what it's doing. Um, so basically what it does here is it goes and creates its own deployment uh, and it has host networking enabled. So that misconfiguration we were talking about. Um, and you can see here it's gone and created them. The evil pod conditions have been met. So it's in, it's going to go through and deploy and you'll see a wall of text. Um, so what that is going to go and do is, is going to go and create a specific deployment that it has access to the, the host networking thing I mentioned talk to the uh, GCP metadata API, uh, pull down those credentials, create a CSR, send that to the API server saying, hey, please let me be a node, and then do that rinse repeat and it will uh, get privileges for that node in every single class, uh, a node on that a host, and then there's also, from that point, you then get the ability to act as the kublet, which can uh, also then jump to other nodes in the cluster. So here you can see here, it's, it's created a nice tied up file of all these secrets, uh, um, et cetera, which are all of the, the nodes running in, in this cluster. Um, so then I will do something that has never been done before on stage. I will hopefully run a tar command with all flags successful for the first time. Um, cluster tar. Wonderful, excellent. And then we can uh, grep, uh, I think it's token uh, in, anyone want to yell out a file? Which one should we go for? Krail, Krail, Krail cert.json. Um, I don't know if the cert itself will be as interesting. I'll do the Krail default. Um, uh, default, and then I will trim it off because these are real creds. Um, head C and 25. So you can see there's the first little bit of a token. So those are valid tokens that in this case basically demonstrates full cluster compromise. Um, and there's tooling out there that's uh, trivial to use. Um, that's not our art, uh, that's a guy called Brad who we've worked with previously who is great, uh, but I demonstrate this just to show how those simple misconfigurations can lead to catastrophic impacts. Um, so kudos to Brad on that stuff. Uh, so jumping back to the slides. Yeah. <coughs> cool. Uh, and then this is a demo of the same thing, if that failed. Um, cool, so we need a solution to fix this. Um, uh, easy to do things wrong, how, how can we improve this? Uh, so we wanted something that would enforce security policies. That's, that's what we're here to do. Uh, we wanted something that ideally would reduce the complexity perceived from, from developers in, um, and where we can't do that, at least increase the visibility for the end users, the ones who don't really care beyond the API server's deployments. Um, we want to really make that information uh, palatable and visible to them. Uh, we don't want to break things that we shouldn't. Um, one of the challenging things for us at the moment with Cruz is that we're in a tech race as much as we're in a trust race. Um, there are other people out there also trying to make self-driving cars. We need to move as fast as possible in this case. Uh, and you don't make friends if you break things. Uh, and then finally, easily extensible as well. A lot of the team members are developers and we want to hack on this stuff ourselves. So we wanted to set up something that was kind of easy to consume and hopefully we could release open source, which we, we have, and then get other people to add on to it as well. Uh, <coughs> so what, what was out there when we started working on this? Um, so people often uh, are quick to, to recommend OPA, Open Policy Agent. Um, they've just released a thing called Gatekeeper, which does some similar stuff. Uh, however, it didn't exist when we started, um, and it's a little bit less mature. Um, it doesn't have the same uh, uh, requirements in terms of the easy exceptions for not breaking stuff. Um, Kyverno, pod security policy, and policy admission from UK Home Office. All similar tools doing similar stuff. Uh, however, yeah, the, the main issue that we identified there was one, ease of exceptions. Uh, and then two, also sometimes, for example, pod security policy, great with pods themselves, um, but not good with the other things that can then go deploy pods, such as deployments, daemon sets, stateful sets, cron jobs, jobs, et cetera. Uh, there are other things in Kubernetes land that can end up with pods, and that level of indirection 
was just a level of confusion and would, didn't make it very visible to developers that they'd try and deploy their thing in there. Oh yeah, the, the cron job would work fine, but it would never actually create a pod later because the pod security policy failed it. Um, so that was, that was a, a bit confusing um, and uh, kudos to pod security policy for the exemptions, however, that, that it, is, it is better at that. So n none of the existing tooling out there really scratched our itch. Um, so we, we went and made our own one. Um, so it's called KRail. Uh, it is now open source. Um, unfortunately, at KiwiCon, uh, we got to the end of the talk, and then we did a really big, dramatic, mash the button release on stage. Um, I don't have that for you as well. Um, but hopefully, I have some other stuff I could possibly play around with, which is, which is exciting. Um, so what, what, what is KRail? KRail is a, yeah, it's a workload policy enforcement tool for Kubernetes. Its features include telemetry, so it makes data uh, easily accessible. Has some great policies out of the box, which we'll walk through some of them. Uh, easy to add those policy exemptions in the cases that you don't want it. Uh, easily passable structure, uh, structured violation data to make that information as visible as possible. And then finally, real-time interactive feedback for developers. Um, and this logo, uh, we actually had to wrestle. We had a previous really sketchy, like, Kubernetes logo over a concrete barrier. Um, our design team came out with this with a little traffic light, which, is, given the car metaphor, is, is pretty apt. Um, so w w what's in a name? Why, why did we you know, choose KRail? Uh, we actually got accepted at KiwiCon under the name Guardrails. Internally, it was just called Security Validator. Uh, that's kind of boring. So we wanted a cool name. Uh, we thought guardrails was really good, given the car metaphor, and it kind of keeps things on track. Uh, unfortunately, guardrails.io is already a security thing, and we didn't want to get sued. Uh, so then KRail is actually the name of those concrete barriers. They're also known as jersey barriers, and it's kind of the same apt thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so how does it work? Um, so in our case, we have a large multi-tenant platform as a service. So different people deploying onto shared cluster, uh, you know, one pod cannot necessarily be trusted by another pod. Um, so we have a group here, many nerds, sometimes some evil hackers in there as well. Um, so then you kube control apply. You have your deployment, you send it off to the Kubernetes death side to deploy it. Um, that then sends an admission review over to KRail. So the validating webhook I mentioned earlier sends it on to that and says, hey, is this good to deploy, yes or no? And then based off the response, gives it back to the developers for them to go, hey, does this actually you know, get deployed or finally is this uh, the right thing to do? Um, and so what does that actually look like? Here we can see it's you know, trying to deploy an evil deployment and it says it's forbidden, you're mounting the Docker socket and you've got host network enabled. Developers get that real-time feedback at deploy time uh, and so they, it's, it's a relatively smooth UX. Um, uh, this is in enforcement mode, in blocking. Um, we also have the ability to run it in uh, non-blocking mode, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, yeah. Uh, so what, what are the policies that we're going to jump into a little bit? Um, so here, uh, this is the uh, non-exhaustive list, actually. The, we, we've added a couple more. Um, we've blocked the ability to exec into pods as well um, and some other ones, but we'll talk through what each of these mean. Um, as a meta level, for people who run uh, uh, clusters, um, if you deploy uh, KRail by default, you'll get all these. Uh, for people attacking clusters, with a bit of creativity, you can think through each of these, reverse engineer them, and think about how to attack them. Um, so, uh, and they also output a, f a log like this. So it's relatively easy to pass. It's JSON. Um, you can figure out, oh, you know, the message is it enforced or not. In this case, it's a, you know, a no Docker socket uh, on the bad deployment. deployment. Cool. So let's walk through some of these policies and figure out what they actually mean. Uh, so host file system, we demoed that before. Um, so that's mounting the file system, and in Linux, anything's a file, so that's the ability to then look into other process namespaces, et cetera, other devices, a um, whole bunch of nastiness coming out of that. Uh, we specifically call out the Docker socket um, because that reason, if you can then talk to the Docker socket, you know, create other containers, exactly into that, you can privilege escalate that way. Um, we also uh, disallow Helm Tiller. Uh, for those unfamiliar, Helm's actually a really nice client that generates uh, some deployments for you, and it's pretty easy to use. Unfortunately, the Helm Tiller server side of things uh, has an unauthenticated API by default. Um, so we try to disable that, and then that just passes them onto the API server. Um, so I'll show you a deployment in a little bit where I still use the Helm client, but then pass it straight to the server uh, instead of going via Helm Tiller. Um, no host networking, so the metadata uh, API uh, stuff that I mentioned there. Anyone, any guesses what that API is? AWS metadata API, yeah, absolutely. Metadata slash latest on top of that. You can get you know, uh, the policies associated with it, private key, et cetera. Um, so don't want that happening. Uh, no host PID. Um, so from there, you can uh, access uh, 
the process namespaces of different things. You could either you know, uh, access root uh, processes or pods, uh, processes associated with other pod namespaces. Um, that's not ideal. Um, capabilities. Uh, so you could add the effective capabilities. And this is an argument of what does Docker and Docker actually mean? Is this exposing the Docker socket or is this granting capabilities to a container that then has the ability to affect change on the host itself? Um, but if you grant the ability to a container to add capabilities to itself, nothing is stopping it from saying, hey, I'm just going to grant myself so capsis admin. Um, uh, Privilege container mode, um, so that's when the deployment comes in in itself. Uh, you notice the direction of the arrows is a little bit. It's, okay, here it's a pod accessing network. Here where the configuration of the deployment itself. Um, so Docker run privileged uh, effectively turns off a lot of the security features. Um, I'm working on a separate talk that enumerates exactly, you know, C groups and a bunch of the other Docker uh, isolation features that get turned off when you turn on the privilege flag. It's a bad idea, don't use it. Um, Immutable tag reference. What's wrong with this? Any guesses? What was that, sorry? Latest can change. Latest can change, absolutely. So if a malicious actor comes in and then pushes over latest, you will pull that down at next deploy time. Um, whereas instead, we actually have a, a guide in the, uh, in the readme that it's a one-liner and it lets you actually pin it to a specific hash. Cool, so that's a, a thing that we do as well. Um, what about this one here, Docker run Tomcat latest? And it's not the same thing. Latest is also a problem, but the full hash didn't fit on the slide. Trusting a third party. A third party. Which, which third party am I trusting in this case? Yeah, exactly. And so this is actually a real case from 2016. Uh, Docker user 123, uh, Docker 123321 pushed an image called Tomcat to Docker Hub. There wasn't an official Docker uh, Tomcat already, and so that got you know, a few hundred downloads because it was, oh, that's the top of, to Tomcat I want. Docker run Tomcat, didn't 404, that's the one I want. It was a crypto miner. Um, so if you pin it to specific repos that you expect, if you run your own registry, you can, uh, you can match on that. We've got some regex that uh, push, uh, matches on GCR and, and Docker Hub by default, um, but you can configure it to be your own internal repository quite easily. Uh, and then finally, uh, ingress exemption as well. Um, by default, uh, pods shouldn't be going out publicly, uh, and so you can uh, require an explicit exemption to say, yes, I want an ingress attached for this. Um, <clears throat> cool, so th those are just some of the policies that come for free, um, and those are the most common misconfigurations that we see as well. Uh, so how do you actually add a policy? We mentioned ease, ease of extensibility. Um, so you just need to fill out this interface. Um, and we'll show a little bit of sample code as well, um, but it's all written in Golang. It's, you know, it's, not, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so this one here is the, the host bind mount that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, you append to that resource violation, you know, the different namespace, the kind, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's one policy. If you want to add other ones, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the exemptions factor as well, um, I'll demo this in a little bit, um, but pretty easy to add exemptions as well. So if you're saying, hey, we normally don't want things to be you know, uh, routable from the internet, but this particular one, yeah, let's add an ingress on that because it's meant to have it. Cool. Um, pretty straightforward even for people who uh, aren't devs. So let's go for a little demo of this. So I mentioned, let me jump back to my other one before. Whoops. Uh, so this previous uh, deployment over here succeeded, um, despite the fact that KRL is currently running on this cluster. And the issue at play here is actually um, evil pod. Um, so this host network true, right? So we should have blocked on this host network. In the example we're talking about here, it was talking out to that metadata API and stealing creds from that. Bad thing, we want to block that. Why was that allowed? Well, spoiler alert, I had an exemption. Um, so the exemption looks like this. So this exemption's here. Default, I've explicitly said everything in the default namespace pod no has, uh, host network. Let me just get rid of this. And it's just as easy to add them. You would basically just fill out one like that. And then let's go and redeploy carrier. Um, so let me go uh, Helm. So yeah, Helm template uh, deploying into the KRL namespace. And then we're talking to the kube control uh, apply. So we're using Helm as a client, but not as a server in this case. And I'll kick off a little deploy. And this is where I pray to the demo gods. Cool. So that looks like it's all sorted. And, then we, and this is a small cluster, admittedly, but still deploying it is, is pretty fast. Um, and so now let's go and actually try this auto own again. And so this is going to go through the auto exploit, try and deploy that same thing that it did last time. Hey, it failed. 
denied, no host network, using the host network demo. So that's the feedback mechanism that devs will usually get. That's the demo. Cool. Um, so back to slides. Yep. <coughs> cool, cool. Um, and that was the backup in case things didn't work, uh, which I'm pretty sure it does the same thing. Cool. So, so how did we actually roll this out? Let's, let's get some data from, from real story. So we run this in production on all clusters at Cruise. Um, uh, here's some, some actual data from a specific cluster. There's you know, 68 namespaces. Um, about half of them had violations based off our initial policies when we started. Uh, one of the challenges with this is, is the number of pods that we're dealing with. So uh, 18,000 is a snapshot point in time. Um, those 18,000 will change. It'll, it'll be different at different points. And so if you ever did an audit and be like, cool, give us a slice of what's happening right now, that would have changed because there's cron jobs, there's th things moving at a very fast rate. Um, and the extra challenge there is that 15 of those exemptions were actually legitimate. They should have been public ingress or they should have been whatever. Um, and how do we go about finding that data while not breaking things for, for teams? Um, so one of the... Uh, the useful things that KRL does as well is that it, it will uh, shove that structured data, if you configure it a little bit, up into uh, Data Studio. Um, uh, and so here we were basically presenting this dashboard out for a couple of weeks in audit only mode. Um, people could sit there and in this red box associated with a particular policy, there were namespaces. And so you could go and be like, oh, this is my namespace. I've got a red box for, oh, privileged containers. Whoops, I should probably turn that off. And we just passively left it there. Um, didn't really push it out. We were just kind of gathering data for the first little training period. Um, did that for two or three weeks. Um, and then kind of the amazing thing that we weren't really expecting uh, happened. We got some amazing customer feedback from the developers. Um, the great thing is that if you provide people with the tools and resources to do the right thing, devs typically want to do the right thing. Um, my, my personal favorite is this one on the right here, is that it was an accidental misconfiguration. When we messaged about the team just saying, like, hey, is this meant to happen? They said, wait, wait what? Stupid stuff was done? It was an unintentional misconfiguration that accidentally introduced a security vulnerability that we picked up for them and then were able to close. Um, so yeah, after, after a few weeks of running like that, um, then we switched into enforcement mode. Uh, and it took us one week uh, to drop the hammer on all clusters uh, and turn off, because we'd already been passively watching for a little bit and said, yep, cool, that one we should uh, add an exemption for, that one's legitimate, uh, that one's not, let's talk with the team. Um, and then come enforcement time, we already knew that we had a pretty uh, tailored, uh, I, I guess, uh, policy map for, for our organization. And so these days, uh, this is what the, um, the enforcement looks like. So we will get a notification in this case. So Dustin deployed evil pod up there, um, was trying to intentionally trigger it. A lot of team, uh, uh, team members at Cruise will try it once and then get that feedback me mechanism saying, oh, no, no privileged container. Ah, I'll turn that off. And then they go and fix it. However, we get this data here, and if it repeatedly is the same problem again, in this case, you can see Datadog agent, it was an automated deploy, we could then reach out to the team and go, hey, this is a continuing problem. Hey, how can we help you configure this appropriately or add an exception where, where appropriate? Um, and we were almost... Uh, I think we, we, we were like, touch wood, we're at a point where we were like, rolled it out with zero impact, but I think Dustin uh, messaged me, it was like, there was one weird edge case where we actually did uh, cause one unexpected outage. But over 18,000 pods, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, Cool. So, uh, conclusion. Uh, we, we gave you a, a brief introduction of, of Kubernetes, a bit of background for those unfamiliar. Uh, we introduced the problem. Uh, we introduced some of the common ways that uh, yeah, Kubernetes uh, clusters can be misconfigured and some of the security implications of that. Uh, we demoed Brad's tool, uh, which is uh, some great tooling associated with exploiting that. Uh, and then finally, we introduced a solution, uh, which is KRail. Um, it is now also open source. Uh, so, we would love for you to use it, um, add some policies, give us some feedback, try it out. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Thank you. Is it on? Yep, I'm on. Hey, I'm on. Thank you very much, Frenchie. Can we have another round of applause? That was fantastic. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate. Now, uh, are there any questions in the audience? Now I can see the audience. It's fantastic. There's one over there. One up the back as well. Um, to give you time cool. to run up there. Up. Speedy runner. Speedy. Yeah, does it support non-Docker runtimes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it uh, depends on whatever you're deploying. Yeah. 
But yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh, there's one down here. I got it. Yeah. I got it. Don't kill yourself on the stairs. Uh, how many of the policies like would apply to GKE or whatever Amazon's one is versus your own Kubernetes deployments? Uh, they're all pretty agnostic. I mean, the, the reason why you'd go with Kubernetes is if you want cloud agnostic considerations. Um, and so the, the no host networking thing, we demoed in a GCP specific context. Um, but that same issue of like, if you don't want pods poking around your network on-prem, still the same policies, um, it's kind of agnostic. Cool, thank you. And there's one up there. Yep. Um, one of the problems that you outlined with pod security policy is that it fails very late, and the whole point of KRail is to fail nice and early. Mm -hmm. Is there a use case for combining both, where you use KRail to cover kind of most cases nice and early, but the pod security policy is there to fall back on if that misses something? Absolutely. Um, uh, the demo gods were not particularly kind to me. That There are some cases where KRL, you can actually uh, get past it in some cases. And that's where pod security policies are the hard backstop that you want for that stuff. Um, the usability cost of that, unfortunately, for most developers, we found was, was, uh, was a bit of an issue. There was a great um, uh, TGIK, uh, thank God it's Kubernetes, which is a Friday blog post uh, by Duffy um, from VMware. And he talked about, and he played around with a bunch of stuff and, and, and did some comparison and talked a lot about you know, the, the formal Linux Foundation pod security policy stuff as well. Um, the, uh, the tool they just released, Guardian, I think it is. Um, let me just give everyone epilepsy in the audience while I... Go through Gatekeeper, sorry. Gatekeeper recently released. Um, we've we played around with it a little bit. I think there's some opportunity for for um, uh, for them to interoperate with a whole bunch of other stuff as well. But TBD, um, it's it's open source now as well, so we're happy to merge or yeah, go our own ways. But absolutely. One more? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think it would work in something like Minikube running locally for a dev? Um, maybe. I haven't tried. Um, yeah, I, I don't see why not. Um, Minikube just spins up a bunch of containers locally. Um, I don't know if Minikube has implemented all, the full API of Kubernetes. Uh, so, you know, validating webhooks is a, uh, a more advanced one. But it, like, I think like apps, V1 apps, like all those sort of things, I think are in Minikube. So, yeah, probably. Um, I, got, I think I got a couple more. I, I, I blasted through my time. So please hammer me with questions. Yeah. So uh, just don't ask the, me to dance. That's not good for anyone involved. Back to the early feedback. Um, Sorry. Thing. Oh, hey. Right. <laughs> um, one of your demos there, the, the dev didn't get feedback until their container was running and tried to actually reach out and do something, and then it got blocked, right? Um, but the, your policy that you had in there where you do or don't have the exemptions would have already run at some point before deployment, I imagine. Can that be piped back to them? As part of as feedback as part of the builder deployment process, uh, maybe I'm not sure which which one you're thinking of earlier. So we intentionally had the exemptions in there to sort of make it seem like everything worked fine, and then at the very end, when I removed the exemption, it succeeded. Well, it succeeded to fail. It succeeded in blocking the, yeah, the deployment. Um, there were some that we were demonstrating which were not KRL specific. It was just deploying misconfigured deployments. Um, which those didn't have any feedback on that stuff. Um, so maybe catch up with me afterwards and uh, I can figure out which ones you were thinking of. And um, The other, yeah, would the other thing I was yeah. wondering is, um, do you happen to know about how much crossover there might be with a non-Kubernetes cluster manager like UCP or something? Or is yeah, it kind of a, yeah. Like it, 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 um, Fargate or, or Docker Swarm. Um, unfortunately, validated webhooks and a lot of this sort of stuff is, is baked on the Kube API. So we, we rely on some of the features that they give us. Um, there would be a lot of value for someone in the space to provide a similar service. Um, but thankfully, by being more opinionated, Fargate and a lot of those other things don't let you foot gun as much as Kubernetes does. Um, so yeah, you get less control, but it's, uh, it's kind of the way they did. But yeah, uh, I'm sure there'd be an opportunity for some sort of uh, tool in a similar space in a parallel cluster manager. Thanks. Yep. Hey, um, so I've only got cursory knowledge of uh, communities, so that's Darn a caveat at the start. So this is only, because it's a webhook on deployment, it's only going to catch stuff in deployment. Correct. So if you've got long-lived st stuff, yep. 
static you're going to have to go out yep. there and audit yourself, right? Uh, yep, static pods uh, that are manually configured on the node will not be caught by this, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, things that are already deployed will yep. not be caught by this, absolutely. Cool. Um, uh, the spoiler alert, the, the volume that uh, I was trying to demo for you, um, as the sweetener, because we did the big deploy at KiwiCon, I wanted to show ways that you could attack KRail. Um, for this, but didn't didn't quite get there. Maybe come and chat with me afterwards. Uh, there's a race condition. If you deploy KRail and deploy something at the same time, we fail open intentionally because we don't want to be putting ourselves in a way where we're blocking these things if you know it's offline or something like that. Again, not breaking things that we don't want to. So yes, you are absolutely correct. It is not that hard security boundary that it could be. Once it is up and running, however, it's pretty robust. Um, yeah, unless there's timeout. So you could DOS the API server, a bunch of other things. Kim, come. Um, so you're you're recommending not to use uh, Helm Tiller uh, because uh, it, it like is unauthenticated by default. Uh, the, yes, yeah, the API server is unauthenticated by default. You can c turn that off, um, but uh, yeah, that, that was one of the features where we said, hey, don't use Helm Tiller. So you can run it securely. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> um, the, the, I, the I, I don't know the server well enough. We, we, we made the design decision not to use the server side of stuff. Uh, the client's super convenient, though. The main advantage for us is that it can uh, delete stuff that like, is no longer in your Kubernetes YAML uh, when, um, when you deploy it again. Uh, is, is there something you'd recommend using for that instead? Kube control delete? I'd, yeah, not sure. Maybe maybe we could uh, chat afterwards about your specific stuff. But um, sure. I yeah, I, I know we just added um, uh, a mutation like safe for deletion tag that you can put on stuff. Um, that was merged yesterday, and I haven't properly checked out the details of that yet. Um, but there's some ways that that'll you know, clean up after itself with KRail itself, but not for pods that KRail is looking at. I don't think yet. Um, but thanks. Awesome and, questions. Were there any more? Fantastic questions. I got oh, well, one there. Yep, there we go. Yeah. Give me one second. Hi, I should uh, caveat. I don't have much experience with Kubernetes as well, but um, possibly being mirrored by some of the other questions, uh, I'm interested in where the YAML files that configure the nodes, etc., would be committed to source control. Yes, and so changes to those files that might trigger some sort of automated scanning, would your tool be able to just run in sort of like a, a checker only mode? Yeah, that, that was uh, one of the first requests, especially from some pen testers as well. They want to be able to just, instead of deploying this, just scan this and give it order. Uh, there's actually great tooling out, at, out there already for a lot of that stuff. And that's more akin to kind of a linter, right? Like it's passing the file and just being like, oh, I'm going to regex for this particular thing, and that's a bad thing. Um, th there's some tools out there that, that do that sort of stuff. Um, if you reach out to me afterwards, I can, I can link you some. Um, I want to say kube audit off the top of my head, but I could be very wrong. Um, the downside of, of uh, us, it, it requires th that deployment object happening in real time. So it, it's in memory, it, deployment comes in, sends it off to the validating web hook. So you would have to deploy it on a cluster for KRail to work. Um, so KRail could not do that, um, but there are some tools out there that can. Were there Anyone any else? other questions? I scared uh, you off. Oh, I got one. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Here we go. So uh, Patrick Gray, who mm -hmm. you know, he runs a podcast, Risky Biz. On that podcast, I think it was about two, three weeks ago, he had a guy from Trail of Bits. Did you catch it? I did not. Okay. No. So uh, Trail of Bits is a company that do company stuff. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they did a, an audit of Kubernetes by itself. Awesome. Right, and overall, they found it was actually it was quite, it was quite solid. There's a few issues. I think TLS was one of them. Yep. And I think that was one of the higher ranked issues because by default, you didn't support it or didn't have it automatically configured. Is that been the same from your experience of like just a default Kubernetes go without additional stuff on top? Um, so the, the, there's some interesting stuff around that, and like there was the billion laughs attack that came out recently. The vulnerabilities in Kubernetes itself, those kind of classes of things, that comes back to the initial threat model where we're talking about Kubernetes administrators um, out of scope for this, right? If you're running an old version of Kubernetes, your administrators need to patch. Um, so kind of slight different focus in terms of what we're trying to fix with the tool. Um, but we found that without an opinionated framework like KRail to guide people in the right direction, um, devs will just you know, start deploying random stuff and then go, oh, I want them to mount the Docker socket. And then, so yes, like without, like if you just turn it on, nothing's deployed. So then there's no vulnerable pods. Uh, but if you turn it on in an organization and let it be used without guardrails, 
yeah, it, it ends up in a misconfigured state pretty quickly. So it's always in the config, that's always the issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. All right, were there any other questions? All right, massive round of applause for Frenchie. That was fantastic. Thank you.